Great. I guess we could uh, kick off. It's 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 going to as we talked about fast food. This is going to be a downhill. It's all can only be downhill from here. But uh, we're going to continue talking about the generalized linear model. And I hope for those of you who came to the lab yesterday, we're doing this kind of interactively. So in a way, you've seen more parts in the lab. Then clearly I talked about on the first lecture. Now we're going to catch up a little bit on this, which I hope we have some questions and stuff around that. And then um, we're going to add a couple of new stuff to this as well towards the end, uh, and hopefully explain a bit of more of the things that are within the lab sheet. Um, but to summarize what I talked about last time, right? So what I tried to convince you about was that machine learning is not magic tool for stuff. No matter what, uh, it's the opposite of this thing. And I think now when we're starting to gather use these massive volumes of data for a lot of problems, uh, we often use machine learning in quite dangerous ways and draw prediction from stuff which we shouldn't really be doing a lot of the time, right? Um, so what I tried to show of what machine learning really is, the way I think of it, uh, is that it's it's good. So what you have is that you have, and this is what the first two parts of the course, or the first part of the course where we did the first two pages, what can we get data in different ways, right? Now Collecting data, creating data, doing all the manipulation that we do before we learn something, there's an enormous amount of work on this, right? And there's very, very, very little data in the world that's used exists, right? Data generally has a purpose because someone has designed a sensor to put somewhere who decided something. That's already biases, right? As soon as you start thinking about measuring something, your bias in one way, right? So there's nothing such as just this is you well, you know what I mean. I don't even know what a good word is for this, but like um, Neil sometimes says happenstance data. It doesn't really exist for that extent. And then we say, okay, but that's not enough because I couldn't measure this thing that I really wanted to measure. Like there's still, still some mismatch with that thing. Okay. So then there is the other part, which is like explicit knowledge in some form. Some of this you might have, but then actually in most cases, you don't have this. This is actually someone else who has this data or this access, this knowledge about something. So now the task of machine learning or is then the thing that basically glues these two things together, right? To try to interpret in one way, if you look at it, Try and interpret and create a frame of interpretation of this data in the knowledge that you put in. The other way to see it is the other way around, right? To try and explain this data by that knowledge, right? Okay. And machine learning is effectively the glue that aims to do this, right? That's how we should see it. So, as a data scientist, now the actual work that most of us end up doing is that. We spend an awful amount of time trying to deal with this. And then we go out and we try to ask and understand what the experts actually know. We try and formulate this mathematically, these things, whatever it is they know. And then we design our machine learning algorithm around that. And most of the time, what I actually find, and this is why we're talking about reasonably simple in one way models in this course is that the more I actually spend, humans are getting awesome at stuff. There's like experts on domains that are 
absolutely brilliant. I told you about these doctors that I work with in cardiology. They're absolutely amazing, right? They know stuff. So the more I actually talk to them, the more time I spend understanding what they know, the machine learning problem generally becomes quite simple. But what I can do is I can, which is kind of in the trend of what a lot of stuff that these internet big giant companies do, is that they say, you know what? Can't be asked to do that. But data is now so cheap. So I collect so much of this, and I'm going to design this really complicated algorithm, and then I can do this thing. But for most things that I'm at least interested in, I'm never going to have a lot of data. So another example that we're working on in the lab is that we're working on trying to design drugs or help designing cancer drugs. Now you have a thing. Thankfully, you might have five or ten patients that have this specific cancer, right? Right. They are really good at dealing with these patients, but that knowledge exists there. But try and fit a line or a function to five points in the parameter space of the human being. Right? Doesn't work. Right? Cool. So this thing, I basically said this now, right? So the access stage introduce an enormous inductive bias in what data to acquire and human bias in what question will probably be asked. And then this same thing I said, which is trying to downplay this, is machine learning will be addressed part. It is perfect. And I saw this quote from a famous statistician called Judea Pearl, who wrote a book a few years ago called The Book of Why, where he tried to argue for causal explanations to things. And he said, Machine learning is curve fitting, but it's quite amazing what you can do by fitting curves to data. Right. Great. So, what do we want from the methods that we work with? Well, in any scenario where you have little data, there's always going to be a spiral or a circle of these things. You're never ever going to say, now I implement my access stage, I implement my access stage, now this is done, and never ever go back to them. I pick my algorithm, and then we go, and that's it. No, you're always looping through this the whole time. So one of the things that I really want from a machine learning system, the six here, well, it's something that can allow me to interpret what I've done in the previous stages, from here, right? So that I can go back to the human expert and say, oh, that doesn't make sense, right? No, it needs to be altered in this way. Oh, what I see from this data is that you've done this. Okay, I need to alter my, I need to measure something more. This is probably really important and so forth, right? Or might even be more interesting, which we're gonna talk about, you measure too much, all of this stuff, these two variables tell the same thing. So actually you only need one of them, right? That's super informative, right? Good. So the model then we picked for this was something then called generalized linear models. Now go through exactly the slides I did last time, you so that we set the scene because there were so few, right? So in, well, now I don't have this problem. So the words I'm using here, because this is really models that are done in statistics, which raises the question, what's the difference between statistics and machine learning? I don't think there is a difference. The only difference is that there's people. There's two different groups of people that are looking kind of different paths to the same technology. And that's sometimes, sometimes really useful because you have a different narrative, and a different narrative enables you to do different things, right? But in terms of just the pure mathematical stuff that we do, it's exactly the same thing. But if you pick up any book or start Googling on these things, what they will talk about is you have an explanatory and a response variable, input output, and our task is to explain the response from this, right? Okay. So the classic example of this, which we've done a lot of the time, is doing linear regression. So in this case, I got initially, I have an ill post problem because I got way too many points and I only have two degrees of freedom of this. So then we make this assumption of saying, well, I don't actually observe the true response variable. 
there is noise added to my response variable, something which is now independent across this thing. Now I actually have more variables <laughs> to determine, so I can't determine this noise. And this leads to these squares, right? Classic one, which you probably know. Okay. So now the main notion of generalizing lots of models from this exact framework is to think about what are we actually going to do with them in the end? Well, we're going to do predictions. So in the end, I want to effectively, the classical notion of least square is explain away the noise at my data, and I estimate the noise, and then I explain away the noise, and I just get the prediction length, right? I actually get the line, right? So if you look at this graph here, I'd like effectively say when what I do with the noise is the noise is the thing that's perpendicular to the black line. So I explain that away and now everything lies on that line. Right? So the way to think about that is taking an expectation. That's how I remove the stochasticity from the system. So I take the expectation of the conditional saying, what is y given x? Okay, so that's the expectation of this. The expectations in this case, I can break the two of them up. This thing here has no stochasticity in it at all. So it just becomes some beta xi gay. And then I have the expectation of the noise. I've defined what the noise is, the expectation of a Gaussian, it's both moments, it's the mean. I picked the mean zero on the previous slide. So that just becomes zero. And that's now my prediction, right? That's like explaining away the noise. Okay. So there's a different way of thinking about this, which is going to allow us to generalize this to larger set of models. And that's to say, rather than thinking of the noise on the prediction side of things, I'm going to think about the noise inside the response variable itself. Okay. So what I did was that I moved this over to this side, and then I'm just going to call this y hat instead. Okay. So I just moved it over like this, doesn't make a difference at all, right? So now I have this thing. So now what I've done is that I said rather one way to interpret this, like the equal sign is clearly symmetric, right? But I'm going to try and have some symmetry. On the first line here, the way I would think about this is that I have a specific y, I have a specific y, but my prediction that's on the other side is stochastic, right? I have a linear predictor, which is not the guy, and then I add something to get to what I see. Now, with this formulation, I'm saying something else. I have a deterministic prediction that predicts something stochastic, right? Okay, this doesn't make any sense at all, but, but that's the semantic I'm thinking about here. Okay, so what effectively I think about now is that I think that my response variable follows this specific distribution. If I made this assumption that we had before, that we had this zero mean Gaussian noise, that here, oh yeah, this here does make sense. <laughs> yeah, so it's a Gaussian over this variable with this mean and this sigma, this thing here, I've just plugged in, this is the mean and this is the variance. Okay, cool. So, we can now generalize this, and this is why they're called generalized linear models, is to say that we are going to say that rather than just being Gaussian, we're going to say that Y can come from anything from a distribution called the exponential dispersion pattern. Okay? <coughs> These are pretty much all the distributions you've ever heard of in here. There's a lot of them in here. And what they are, we're going to talk about them a bit more specific later and parameterize them in a sense, in, in a way that makes sense. But this is it. And then we have a linear predictor. This is really important because of the interpretability factor. We say that the way you combine your inputs, your explanatory variable, is in a linear manner, right? Um, this is nice because it, is, it makes it easier to explain. If this B, beta j is zero, it means that the j dimension has no importance on the outputs, right? 
if one is not bigger than the other, and if the scale of these vectors are the same, well, it means one is a lot more influential on the prediction than the other, right? You can see how if you reason about price transit, this is exactly the thing that we want to do, right? And if it turns out and you train your model, you get the super big beta to something that you think, oh, this makes perfect sense. It's the color of the ceiling in the kitchen that's the most determining factor of price transit. Cool. So that you're a data scientist, right? You don't really, you're not an expert on anything, right? You're an expert potentially on data. Now you go back to someone who knows a lot about it. I'll go to you because we had a discussion yesterday about how prices and we had I learned a lot. So then you look at this and say, no, 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 no. This doesn't make any sense at all. Like this is a ridiculous thing. It doesn't actually, you found this in the data, but this this doesn't make sense. Cool, cool. What we probably need to go out is measure this and this and that. Right, so we go out and do that. We train it again, and then we see, oh, now that data disappeared. Ah, I trust you now. This seems like a sensible prediction. Right, that's the narrative that you need to build in order to be in this data science loop. Right. Okay. So then we have this most important object, which is the link function, and it's the link function is the thing that connects. The linear predictor of the risk or of the explanatory variable to the first moment of the distribution of y. Right? Okay. Good. So it's sometimes easier to think of the inverse of the link function instead. So what I want to use, right, is that I want to use this expectation as a prediction. That's like the outcome. If I say something, if I tell someone, I think you should pay this much for the house, it's that expectation that I want to give them, right? So now I can think about the inverse instead. So that's, but it's all the same effectively, right? And now I said this, if you've seen a lot of neural networks or you've toyed at these things, there's a really nice article here, because effectively a neural network is just a recursion of these. You take this one, you take the output of that, and make that the x's in the next layer, layer, and then you just keep doing that over and over again. That's like what's called a neural network. Okay. Right. So let's then begin. This is the first new stuff then. So let's begin thinking about this. Okay. So you have this data. So the first thing you're always going to do. And you did that with the motorcycle data if you plotted that one well, yesterday. If you plot it, right, that's a very sensible thing to do to figure out what model you're going to do. Even if you get higher dimensional data, you start plotting dimensions, two dimensions, all this stuff, right? That's your investigation part, right? So let's say I plot the disk, and then I think, great, the only capability I have is a linear model. And now I want to fit this. How do we go about doing this? Oh, uh, logarithmic link function. Yeah, very good, very good. I will do the logarithmic that. Okay, so now I'm going to play the silly one, right? And say that looks an awful lot like an exponential to me. So what I'm going to do is before I see this data, I'm going to pre-process it, and I'm going to take the logarithm of this, and now it's a line. It's going to look like a line, and then I'm just going to pick the line to that. Are those two things equivalent? So that's like the linear regression setting, right? I just say I'm just going to transform the data itself. So I'm going to transform this, make it a line, and then I'm going to pick the line to it. The noise will become exponential. Exactly. Super good, right? So let's just look at this. So this is just because this is something that we very often do. But we can't forget the noise because it fundamentally changes the characteristic of the distribution that we're fitting. Okay, so let's say I do this, right? So I'm just going to say I'm going to take a log here. That means, and then I'm just going to fit this, right? So if I do the log of this, what am I actually doing? Well, if I do the linear regression case, well, I have this epsilon here, which let's say I assume this was Gaussian. What I'm actually fitting is this model. So now I have a proper noise instead. I have a noise that depends on where I am in X. If X gets bigger, this gets noisier. 
So I get this structure, which is also a really useful model. You will see a lot of cases where you have exactly this structure, where you've got a heteroscedastic noise, right? The more signal I get, the more noise I get, right? If I did just this thing here, where I do the inverse <laughs> here, so I do the X here effectively as the, no, I do the log as a link function, right? Now, that assumes that the noise fits on Y, right? So effectively, this is what I'm fitting now, where I move the epsilon over from this end, right? So the noise assumptions are fundamentally different. What I've just plotted here are samples around these two things, right? And you can see how they're fundamentally different, right? Good, super good. So a Gauss or a generalized linear model is not just the transformation of the data and then you fit it. It's really important to remember that the noise assumption is there, right? And if we would, I should have really done this, if we would have fitted, take this data, and we would have fitted either this or that to it, we would have seen that the prediction would have been different. Yeah? I think it probably would have been different. We're going to come to an example where it's definitely going to be different in a bit. Okay, so let's then talk about this family that we had. It's called then the exponential dispersion family. And the nice thing about it, and the way to think about it, is that the canonical formulation of this is a this. That's the density function of it. And what it has is that it has two parameters, a location parameter and a scale parameter. Right? So for a Gaussian, we're going to see exactly what the parameterization of this is for it. We can pick out something which only depends on where the prediction sits and another parameter which says the plot around that prediction, right? Which is your scale. You have these two nine parameters that you can interpret. We would also always assume in these type of models that the noise is IIT. So it's just added independently each time, right? Okay. So if we do this for a Gaussian, that's a Gaussian written in the form of an exponential dispersion family. You've probably never seen a Gaussian written like this. It's a bit of an ugly form of writing it. But from that, you can now pick out very, very clearly what these things are. So you've got the scale parameter, which is the mean, and you've got the square this or the variant, which is used uh, the, uh, what was the other parameter called? Scale, and I said it. Location. No, location. This is the scale. Sorry, that's location. This is the scale, right? Sorry. Yeah, good. Thank you. And then you've got these functions here. Right to get it back to this. Okay, so why do we do this? Why is this important to do? Well, the nice thing about this is if I want to compute the expected value of something, it is that. This is the derivative of B of the scale parameter or the location parameter. And if I want to compute the variance of something, it is this. So now you have a consistent formulation of these two, which is quite nice. And that's what this slightly messy formulation gives you. It just gives you a canonical form that you can always work with. Okay? We're not going to do these things. The packages are going to output them for us, but I wanted to show you this at least. Okay? Okay. So the package that we're using is this stats models one. And it's really only three commands that you need to use for this. So you create a model DLM, you go got your response explanatory, and then you define the distribution and the link function like this. That sounds a little bit odd, right? Because I said those two defines themselves, right? If I pick this distribution, this is the link function. Okay. There is a slight caveat to this. So there's something called a canonical link function, which is exactly like that. If I pick the distribution, this is the link function. But sometimes, and you're gonna see a case of that later on, we actually pick a non-canonical link function. So we're actually not doing exactly what I told you to do. We're actually saying, it follows this distribution, 
And we're going to see why the distribution is important because it becomes important in the infra. But we're going to use a slightly different link function for, for different reasons. Right? So we have to be a bit practical about this sometimes. So the families of distribution that I think are involved, binomials, we're going to see, gammas, we're going to see, we've only seen Gaussians, inverse Gaussian, negative binomials, we're going to see Poisson, and we've got the coolest name, which is the Tweedy distribution, which is a generalization of several distribution. If you can come up with a way of using this in your final project, you'll get a gold star because I love the fact <laughs> Tweedy. Um, then you've got link functions here, lots of them. Uh, and we're going to use a few of these now. The one that is in the log, we're going to use the log it for the next case, right? But these are the things that you play around with. And what you can do is just get how, well, how would I approach this problem, right? I would just generate, take a model like this, and then we just predict from it to see, oh, if the data looks like this, this is the model I could probably use. And then you look at your data on your own, you can now see, oh, it looks like this. I can pick this. Right. That's effectively how you would work with this. So it's a very iterative process. Okay, so the first one then we're going to talk about is if I have something which is distributed as a binomial. So the way to think about this is that I'm going to do something four times, and I want to know the probability of success for doing that. So I'm going to, the classic example, I'm tossing a coin four times and success is getting hex. What's the probability for a biased coin then in this case to give me four hex, right? Okay, that's the binomial. So let's now think about how we would design a model that can reflect data like this. So I have these things. So I have this linear predictor. I only have one input dimension, x in this case. And I say that y is distributed as this binomial. So y is now a frequency or an odds, right? So we need to pick a link function that limits y to this range, right? That's the first thing. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense at all, right? So that's the parameterization of the binomial. Right? So I need to find something here that effectively, another way to think of it, is, it is a frequency, but if you're a frequency statistician, you think that's a probability. So therefore, you think this has to be obeying these things, okay? okay? So simplest thing that I could think of is the log it function that looks like this. So the log it function does look like that. And now I'm going to walk through a very kind of unnecessary thing to show you what model this is. Right? So this here is the link function. If I derive the inverse of this, I'm going to get the model. Right? Now, instead of just flipping that graph around, I'm just going to show you this once. Okay? So this is the relationship we have. So we say log this is equal to that. Right? That is the definition of the log it. So I'm going to exponentiate on both sides. So I get this. Then I'm going to multiply up the y's and isolate them on one side. So I'm going to get this. And then I'm dividing this on that side. And now I'm going to just take the denominator and divide it, the nominator and divide it in the nom denominator. And I get this. Cool. Have anyone seen this function before? Exactly. Uh, have you ever used this function before? Or? For, for, say again? Activation function. Oh, activation. Function. Absolutely. But also, you said something different. In your network. Yeah, you're running your networks in the setting of classification, right? So, this is how you normally do classification with probabilities, if you think about it. So, another way of you showing this, right, is just taking that curve and flipping it around, right? That's exactly the curve it is, right? It's the inverse of that curve. I used the right that. <laughs> but that there, is used the sigmoid function, which actually says up there. 
So this is something called uh, uh, logistic regression. So what I'm now going to do is that I found this data set, uh, which is of binomial data. So this data set is for swapping cows with electricity and seeing at what current they start reacting. Okay, so no cows were harmed during this experiment. So what we have here is we've got the current that we give. We have 70 cows, or I don't know if it's 70 different cows, but there's 70 tribes. And then we see how many react or not to this, right? That's the aim. And we still effectively want to determine at what level, if I prod this cow, they will all react, but I don't want to give them more current than that because that seems unhealthy. So what I can then do is I can use apply this thing in the science model package, right? Doom, doom. And then I pick the family is binomial, the link function is the log it, and then I get that, right? You could put another link function here that would give you a different thing between zero and one, and you would have gotten a different type of classifier, right? You wouldn't have gotten the sigma, you would have gotten something else, right? Okay, and now you can see, kind of, we don't have enough cows, but you can kind of see that the noise here is actually IID on the this curve, right? So we have exactly the same thing that we explain away the whole time. Okay, good. So the next one, which I think now we're starting to get to something which is probably a bit more relevant, uh, especially if you're waiting for busters. This is the classic example of why there's no bus to arrive and then on the arrives at the same time. So Poisson distribution uh, comes from the notion of say that if I have a restaurant. And then I know I have a certain number of customers that are going to come in. What's the probability over a specific time window that lots of them come up in that time window? That's the distribution that I'm looking for. Okay. So we're going to derive this now. And the reason why I'm picking a couple of these or three of them is that I'm effectively deriving models. In, that you might have seen in different ways, right? But they all end up being uh, these generalized linear models. That's effective. And this is the second way I'm thinking about it. So what I want to do is that I say that the observation I have is Poisson distributed, and then this here is the distribution for that. That's the actual formulation for this. And now the expected value of this is this, which is the thing I want to predict with the linear predictor. Yeah. That must be a user negative lambda. Yeah. Oh, should it be a negative lambda? If it's not a negative lambda, yeah, exactly. So that has to be well, hang on. The fact. Factorial, can someone just check on Wikipedia here? Because the factorial grows quicker than the exponential, right? It's, it's it is e to a negative. Okay, so then it just falls off really quickly. Good. Point taken. I will alter this. I believe my next slide is also going to be wrong. Very good. Um, so, again, what I'm going to do in this case is that Counts are positive, so I need some form of positive link function in this case. So I'm going to pick the log for this again, right? So if I did that, I'll be just doing the same model as we've previously done before, right? I, I you said, okay, so now I've got log of this, which is equal to that, right? Are we picking the same thing again? What, where does actually the distribution come into play here? Yeah. So what I'm trying to learn about this thing, when I started introducing these models, I said there's this canonical link function, and then you pick the distribution and it gives you a link function, right? Now I'm introducing this and I'm saying, I'm going to pick this link function, and I've picked this distribution of why. What's the difference here? Where does this come in? It doesn't actually come in at all in the prediction. 
What it comes into is what we're going to talk about in a few slides, and that is that it describes a completely different model, right? So, if I write this up, if I would actually write up what the model of this thing is, right, the actual distribution that it would formulate, it's this. Except for the minus I get. This is the probability distribution that I am modeling the first moment of using the linear predictor. But this here is really important when I train the model. Right? This actually makes a difference. It makes a difference on the form of the noise, I guess. Right? Because this is where the noise actually comes in. Right? Okay. So an example of this, and this is like something that I think could be useful for the, for the house, house example, is that in this case, it's the Brooklyn Bridge. And what I have <coughs> at this uh, data is that I have how many people are crossing, how many cyclists, importantly, are crossing the bridge at this specific day. And the information I have is the day of the week, the month it is, the temperature, and if it's raining or not. You can see that day when it rained a lot, lots of people just didn't cycle. So, okay. So, what I can do then is that I can fit this thing here using exactly the command as we did before. And in this case, the log that I picked is the canonical link function for the Poisson. So in this case, if I just don't specify anything, it's going to pick what it's referred to as then the canonical link function in this case. Cool. And then here's the blue data is the data that I've seen, and the, the red one here is, is the model that I fitted to this. Okay, so the last one that I wanted to show was the gamma distribution. And the gamma distribution is effectively waiting times for Poisson distributed events. So if I think the buses arrive as Poisson distribution, what is the probability of me having to wait for the next bus? Right? So this would be a really interesting thing if you think about how sales might be distributed according to a Poisson. Now, if I want to sell a house, how long would I expect that I would take for me to sell a house, right? That would be something, right? I will be able to get the distribution out of that. And the nice thing about this and why I wanted to show this is that the gamma distribution is, has this asymmetric shape, right? So I'm going to show you an example of this here. This is a type of data that you would fit with gamma regression. Okay. So you can see this here. I have a noise distribution or I have a distribution of the data which is very asymmetric around this. Right? You can see that I get a lot of data down here and then I get these tails up there. If I put a symmetric model around this, it would probably push up that prediction a lot, right? And I don't want that because I want something that takes into account. Sometimes you're just standing there waiting for that bus forever, right? And it can happen. And those things we want to take into account, right? That's what a gamma distribution will give you. Okay. So, oh, wrong way, wrong direction. So, in the <laughs> exponential dispersion formulation, that is the gamma distribution, which we now can pick out exactly the parameters of the mean and the variance, or, or, or this, the scale and the location, which allows us to compute the mean and the variance of these two things, okay? So, now, normally, if you would derive the canonical link function of this, this is something that I haven't worked enough to be able to actually say why this is. The canonical link function would be this. This is what you should be using. But actually, what you do, or you have to pick something that extracts this. 
The no, but what people actually always do in practice, I don't know if Neil knows about this, why are people always using the log as a link function for gamma? Because uh, log additivity leads to uh, product of the features. Oh, I see. So it's an uh, interesting. Uh, it meets uh, meet you with uh, interpretability. So I see. Um, if you use other link functions, you lose interpretability because you are uh, no longer have a product of the features. <laughs> so it's log additive. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually saying e to the minus beta times the feature product yeah. of those. So effectively, you're sort of getting um, an AND gate effect. Yeah. So you were, I mean, not really an AND gate, but like when it's additive, you're sort of getting an OR gate effect that the more things that are on, the higher the rate goes. But when it's log additive, you're getting, if anything zeroed out, everything shut down. Um, so there are times we have a paper on this actually, there are times when you don't really want that. And people aren't really thinking a lot about the link function, particularly the really interesting thing in stats is because they write it in this. No way, they like log equals sum, which doesn't highlight at all that it's actually a product of the features that's yeah. going on. Um, and for some link functions, like you could use um, one thing you could use would be log of one plus e to the x, like the soft ReLU. I've used that quite a lot, but it, it's interesting because in some regions it's additive. Right, but then in other reasons, it's doing something else, and you lose interpretability on the features. And most of these things are statistical models, so they're very keen on maintaining that interpretability. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. Um, and I talked about it with digital colleagues at some point who also said, Yeah, it's not often not appreciated enough for self of that. But yeah, so log out, log. So, yeah, it's a product of the features. Interesting. Sometimes it gives numerical problems. Yeah. yeah. That's a very good, I guess, also because it's one over, you would, yeah, you would actually have them. Yeah. Oh, so only a much. But, but, but actually, so, that, so following up from this thing, like one of the things I, I, I now see, and I'm trying to rise up with a probabilistic model at the boss for these things. And the question is, why is that important? Or, because this is the thing when we're finding, um, when we're optimizing, when you're doing this, the, the fit command that you're actually trying getting out, finding these betas, what it's effectively doing all the time is that it's doing a maximum likelihood of this. And now inside that model, there's specific packages doing specific models in clever ways. But what you can effectively think about, if you could write this thing up, you have y and x, you have betas that are unknown, you could formulate this and do a gradient descent on this, right? That's the way. We're not going to dwell on this too much. We're just going to assume, and this is the nicety of working with linear models, that we can kind of, in most cases, assume that if you manage to run this, you can trust the results, right? If we start building more complicated models, we've always this thing, did I actually find the best thing? Is it the model that's wrong or is it my inference mechanism that's wrong? And in this case, we can kind of assume this. And the IID assumption that I said was really important is just the thing that allows us to do that product, right? And that makes everything much shinier. Cool. So the last thing then, or the couple of last things that I wanted to talk about, is how do we design our data? So actually, the, the response that you want, that we give, it's always going to be a matrix of these, right? So let's say, even if I'm doing linear regression, I got two details, right? I got a, a slope and an intersection, right? So the simplest way of doing that, we've all seen this before, right? Is I added column of one. So now what you're effectively doing already here, right, is you're creating your data in one way, right? This, you're normally used to have seen motivated by, well, it just makes it nicer because I can do everything in matrix products, right? But actually, thinking about how you set this up is really a key thing, right? So let's take this one, this example that I used. I have this tricky thing here. And now what I want to do is I want to fit a generalized linear model to this. Clearly, it's not directly linear in X, right? It isn't, as we can see up there. 
So what I can do now is, of course, I can create a design matrix, which includes those basic functions as well. And now you can think <laughs> of in the example of the house prices, for example, you might have something in here, which is something that you want to investigate. I actually think that the distance from the closest cryptic pitch is clearly the most important, that would be five quarter house, uh, uh, is like the most important characteristic of house prices. Who we'll also put that in, right? We'll see what beta comes out, right? There might be something else, which is a combination of distance from cricket pitch to what's the thing I don't like. I like most things, but saying something else, right? It's like, I really like, that's the idea of setting. You put this stuff in, and then you can start analyzing these things, right? That sounds great, right? Because now that design matrix, the linear structure, allows me to write this narrative about the data. Okay? So then how about if I do this? So I do something super silly. So I add something twice. Or let's think about this in the general setting. I add two things that mean exactly the same thing. I don't know that initially, but they actually do mean the same thing, right? So now, if I apply the same model to this, exactly the same Gaussian linear model, these are the two coefficients that I get from this. So what it decided to do is take half of each, right? Those two components are the same. But that's really annoying, right? And clearly now, there's a massive amount of symmetrical explanations here, right? Where you can take any weighting of these, and it's going to effectively have the same... Um, um, the low likelihood won't be affected by any of these, right? So how do we come up with a way of choosing explanations? I have to be a bit quicker. So I'm going to talk about that next time. So the way we do this is that the maximum likelihood here encodes no preference for different solutions at all, right? It's just happy about whatever it takes to give you this answer, I'll do it, right? So what we can do is that we can add a regularization term. This is normally done by a norm. <laughs> so what we say here is that I have this objective here. But then I also want to say there's specific betas that are going to cost you more than others. Right? So if you give a specific beta structure, it's going to hurt you. And I prefer this explanation. Because this has nothing to do with the data, right? This is just the preference of the explanation that you have. So there's two ones which are involved here uh, that we often talk about. You've often heard, maybe you've heard the terms rich versus lasso or rich or lasso. So this one here is the L1 norm. And this here is the L2 norm, right? So now, to try and explain to you why these give different preferences, normally the red one will give you something where it pushes, or the, <laughs> where it pushes one of the variables down to zero. And the reason for that is the way I think about it is that I'm a predictor, I'm a linear predictor, I need a certain mass in my betas to get up to the answer that we want from. The L1 says that, well, actually, if, if this is where you need to go, well, you're getting a massive penalty here, right? This is an isosurface one. Well, the L2 norm says, oh, well, that's fine. I only care about the length of your vector. Well, the L1 is much happier if you need a specific mass, if you need the mass of one to go out on the that one along one axis. So if you apply the L1 regularizer, it would probably turn off one of the signs. And if the L2, it would keep both of them. So the way you do this, is you just change your command, fit regularized, and then you have alpha, which is the penalty of how much regularized you should have, put zero, which is the, the, the thing in front of the norm, and then this regular, this L1 weight term, zero, it's the square, one is the, is the, is the red one. So you can play around with these two and see what explanations that you get. So, I'm just going to end there, and uh, then I'm going to talk about more about models and a few more things next time. Give you a few ideas about how we can think about doing this, uh, how we can think about defining design matrices, and so forth.
Cool. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, if no one throws us out, I'm more than happy to take a few questions and stop sharing them. Oh, I should stop recording. Please.